escalation of global terrorism, crime, immorality, and natural disaster seems to indicate our world is spiraling towards its ultimate hour with destiny. Who, if anyone, will survive Earth's final events? Discover what Bible prophecy reveals about the rapture, the mark of the beast, and Armageddon. Though shrouded in mystery for centuries, the book of Revelation can be understood today. Peer into the future and see what wonderful things God has planned for his people. And now, Pastor Brian McMahon presents the powerful Bible seminar, Revelation Speaks Hope. Our subject for this evening is entitled, The Unpardonable Sin. Now, I have met people who have committed sins in their life, and those sins are so burdensome to them that they feel that they have committed a sin that is unpardonable before heaven. And for some, they think that sin is murder. They think, well, I've committed murder. Certainly God couldn't accept me. But we know that murder is not the unpardonable sin. Why? Because we see great people in the Bible, such as Moses and even David, who committed murder, and yet God forgave them, didn't he? In fact, they, go, they went on to become great leaders for the Lord. Now, some would say, well, perhaps it would be denying Christ. It would be, you know, denying him to his face, as, as it were, with great swearing and cursing, and as some have done. But even then, we know that that is not unpardonable because Peter did that very thing, did he not? And the Lord forgave him. And of course, he became a great leader in the Christian faith, in the early church. Some say suicide is the unpardonable sin. Well, certainly suicide would be an, a very undesirable way to leave this world. But even suicide is not what the Bible calls the unpardonable sin. God alone is the judge as to who will be saved and who will be lost. Amen? And God alone will judge the condition of that person's mind and heart as they left this world. But what exactly is the unpardonable sin, and why are we talking about it tonight? Well, one reason we're talking about it is because Jesus talks about it. And if Jesus talks about it, it must be important for you and for me. Wouldn't you think so? There must be a reason. Now, I will tell you this, though, and I hope you'll find this as good news. We're not talking about the unpardonable sin because we think that anybody in this room has committed it. Had you committed the unpardonable sin, the chances are you certainly would not be here tonight. So why are we talking about it? We're talking about it because as we learn the steps that lead up to the unpardonable sin, then we'll make the decision in our hearts that we don't want to take any of those steps. What do you say? You see. So let's go take a look at Matthew chapter 12 and verse 30. He says, He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. What we're seeing here is that Jesus is taking away all neutral ground, isn't he? He's saying, you're either with me or against me. There's no sitting on the fence. You can't just say, well, I'm not going to make a decision and somehow I'm going to slip through. No, Jesus is saying there is only one of two sides and you have to be on my side totally. And then he goes on and talks about the one and only sin he cannot forgive. In verse 31, he says, Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto man. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So here the Bible says, all manner of sin shall be forgiven. Now, what's another word for manner? Well, another word for manner would be kind of sin. So any kind of sin or any type of sin, the Lord says it shall be forgiven. Isn't that good? Don't we serve a wonderful God? You see, we read these verses here in 1 John 1 and verse 9, the word says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So we may be great sinners, but don't we have a wonderful Savior? No matter what kind of sin you can name, whether it be murder or lying or stealing or committing adultery, that's a kind of sin. Jesus says that can be forgiven. And so we know that we don't have to walk around with a great burden of guilt on us. We can come to Jesus, we can lay that burden down, and he says that can be forgiven. We just have to claim his promises. But what about this sin that is so unpardonable that it cannot be forgiven, the Lord says, in this world or in the next? Well, in order to understand the unpardonable sin, we have to understand the delicate way that the Holy Spirit speaks to the human mind. Now, to start doing that, let's go to John chapter 16, if you would, please. And we're going to begin reading here in verse 7. The Bible says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient, which means necessary, that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Some people think the Holy Spirit is just an impersonal force. 
But friends, the Bible tells us the Holy Spirit is one of the Godhead, the third member of the Godhead. It has personality. You can wound the Spirit. You can grieve the Spirit. You can resist the Spirit. And so let's now go on here to verse 8 where it says, And when he is come, he will reprove the world of what? Sin and of what else? Righteousness and judgment. Sin, of course, because the Holy Spirit will convict us of what is right and what is wrong. The Holy Spirit also of righteousness to lead us to want to do what is right and of judgment to come to lead us to an understanding that we are accountable to our Creator. So this is all the works of the Spirit in our life. So we know that forgiveness is a gift of God. But did you know repentance is a gift of God as well? That God gives repentance unto people? And so is it possible, we ask, that rather than say yes to God, as God speaks to us, we say no to God. Well, it is possible. And every time we say no to God, who is trying to speak to us and say, change your life here, resist doing this or that evil, stop doing this mistake, you know, give your heart to Jesus, every time the Holy Spirit is speaking those kinds of words to us, if we resist that voice and say, no, I don't want that in my life, it's as if you take a step away from that voice and you harden your heart and that voice is not as clear the second time because you've resisted the conscience. And so the Holy Spirit again speaks to us and says, come back to me. And you take another step away by saying no. And every time you say no, it's like putting bricks in a wall between you and God. And as you, it's an interesting thing about this brick in the wall analogy. When you start putting bricks in the wall by saying no to the voice of God, it becomes easier to say no again, and pretty soon you're putting in more bricks and more bricks. The Holy Spirit, or rather the unpardonable sin, is not when a person starts putting bricks in the wall. It's when a person has put so many bricks in the wall, you've said no so many times to that voice that you've shut off that voice entirely and don't hear it anymore. It's not that God stops calling us, folks, but we're losing our ability to hear. Amen? So to have the Holy Spirit in our life means to have a heart that deeply, deeply loves Jesus. It is to have a mind that is filled with the words of the Bible. It is to have a determination to follow truth. But what about those who know what God's will is and continue to resist and not do it? That's deliberate. Well, Jesus said in John 14, verse 15, and you know this from coming to the seminar, he says, if you love me, do what? Keep my commandments. Now, we read that verse a number of times, but what often people don't read is what comes after that. Because in John 14, verses 16 and 17, here's what we read. After telling us to obey him, he says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, speaking of the Holy Spirit, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But then Jesus says, But you know him, for he dwells where? In you, and uh, with you, and shall be in you. In Acts 5 and verse 32, this is another verse that we have seen previously, um, the, the disciples said, and we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, this is what we're talking about tonight, whom God has given to them that do what? Obey him, that's right. And so, once again, God gives the Holy Spirit that we, for those who desire to obey him. Now, here's another question for us. What is the main reason that God pours out his spirit upon his people? Well, in Acts 1, verse 8, this is what we read. The Bible says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be, what, folks? Witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So the Lord says, When I pour out my spirit, my Sons and daughters will be witnesses unto me. This is, again, one of the main reasons God desires to fill us with his power. Now, another verse, Acts 4, verse 31, the Bible says, And when they had prayed, the place were, was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and spake the word of God with what, folks? With boldness. And so the result of being filled with the Holy Ghost is not that they could speak in tongues necessarily. There are some times when the Bible tells us they were given that gift. But that is not primarily the reason God poured out His Spirit. God poured out His Spirit that the gospel would be carried to all the ends of the earth with a boldness that they did not have previously. Now let's go back to John 16, if you would, please. John 16 and verse 13 is where we want to go, friends. The Bible says this, How be it when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all what? Truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he sh whatever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Now, this is telling us about another work of the Holy Spirit. 
and that is that the Holy Spirit is sent to us to be a teacher and therefore to resist any teaching of the, Holy, uh, of the Bible is not simply to resist a teaching per se, but is to be resisting the Holy Spirit that is meant to guide us into that teaching. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. Malachi 3, 6 says, I am the Lord, I change not. Now think about this with me. The same Holy Spirit that inspired the Bible writers to write down the words so many years ago that we now call Holy Scripture, that exact same Holy Spirit is present here with us tonight to speak to our hearts to lead us to understand what those words have to say. Amen? It's the same Holy Spirit that never changes. So when the Holy Spirit is here tonight, the Holy Spirit is the same Holy Spirit that caused these words to be written. No change. Therefore, if I study the Bible and I find out what the Bible says on death, for example, and because of my past background, because of my past cultural upbringing, I desire not to listen to what the Bible has to say, but I insist on clinging to what I used to believe. I'm not just resisting a teaching per se. I'm resisting the Holy Spirit that desires to lead me into the truth of that teaching. In the day when the millennium is over, when the second resurrection takes place and multitude upon multitude raise up in the second resurrection forever lost, there's going to be the greatest feeling of conviction that there has ever been. But it's going to be too late. At that time, they're going to realize when the Bible says, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. The Bible, God said what he meant and meant what he said. Isn't that right? And at that time, they're going to realize that they should have listened to what the word had to say. Now, once again, the Bible tells us in Revelation 19 and verse 15, speaking of the second coming of Jesus, it says, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. Why? What is this sharp sword? Well, Hebrews 4.12 says, The word of God is a sharp sword. So the, the word of God is pictured here coming out of the Lord's mouth and smiting the nations. Why are they sm smitten with the word? Because they have not obeyed the word. The word was there. They could have obeyed it. This goes right along with John 3 and verse 19, and we've covered this on a previous night. In John 3, 19, the Bible says, and this is the condemnation, which is another way of saying this is why people will be condemned, that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Being a committed Christian is not just living up to the truth that you do know, it's having our minds open to the truths that God wants to share with us that we don't know, amen? It's living up to what we do know, but it's also being open to what the Bible has to say about what we don't know. Because again, God wants to always lead us onward. In John chapter 7 and verse 43, here's what we read. It says here, So there was a division among the people because of him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? The officers answered, Never a man spake like this man. In other words, what they were saying was, We are convicted. This is different than what we've heard. We feel that this could be right. Never have we heard things that have come from this man. Okay, so then listen what they said back. Then answered them the Pharisees, Are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed on him? Can you see what they're saying, dear folk? They're saying, hey, listen, until the popular people have believed it, then you don't have to believe it. Until the popular ministers believe it, then you don't have to believe it. It's no different today. It's no different today. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2. 2 Thessalonians 2, starting in verse 9. Paul says, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and what kind of wonders? Lying wonders. So you see, it is Satan that depends upon the wonders and the signs and these kind of things because he can deceive people by it. Well, let's read on. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth. The insincere person tries to change the word to fit his desires. The sincere person says, Lord, change my desires to fit your word. Now let's keep reading here. It says, they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, it's not that God sends a lie necessarily, but if you turn away from truth, that's all there's left is lies, right? You know, you shut off the light, there's darkness. Why? Because you only have the two. When you turn away from truth, you're going to accept a lie somehow, some way. Satan will provide it. If I am going to believe with all my heart and all my soul that my beloved grandmother is up in heaven right now, is it going to make it so? Because the Bible says the dead know not what? Anything. That's right. 
The Bible says the dead are asleep, waiting to call the life giver, Jesus, in the resurrection. And so I might want to believe it. I might be sincere in believing it. It's not going to make it so, though. Be careful of excuses, friends, because people can use excuses when they don't want to really follow what God has to say. There's a story in the Old Testament that I want to share with you, and that is, of course, the story of King Saul. King Saul, of course, started good, and then, of course, he started to do his own thing. He wasn't listening to God as closely as the Lord wanted him to, and finally the Lord was going to give him a test and said, King Saul, you go down among the Amalekites. They, have, they are so wicked, they've passed the time of their probation, and I'm paraphrasing some here, but they said, I want you to go down with your army and slay everything, everything that's alive. I don't want nothing left. King Saul said, okay, I'm going to do it. And so there's King Saul. He takes his army down among the Amalekites, and he slays everything, but, and here's the but. Remember what the goats are known for? Butting. Okay, but he leaves the king alive and some of their animals because, hey, why slay our animals and sacrifice? Why not use their animals and keep ours alive? So he rationalizes this out. So he comes back from the victory, and who does he meet coming along the way but the prophet Samuel? Isn't it interesting that the prophet always comes along at just the right time? <laughs> you know, God's timing is perfect, isn't it? And so the prophet comes, Samuel comes marching down the road, and, and uh, Samuel, or, or King Saul says, I've obeyed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel just cuts right through that, and he says, oh, is that right? Why do I hear this bleeding of sheep in my ears if you've obeyed God? In other words, if you've obeyed God, I would not be hearing the sounds of animals. Amen? And then Samuel says this to King Saul, which is so pertinent to our subject tonight. It says in 1 Samuel 15 and verse 22, And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? And then he says, Behold, to obey is what? Better than sacrifice and to hearken to the fat of rams. Friends, you can do all kinds of things in the name of worship, all kinds of things as a pretense of obeying God, but unless you really are obeying God, the Lord says it means nothing. To obey is better than sacrifice, better than the pretense of worship. Friends, that's what, God is, that's what God was looking for then. He's looking for that also tonight, isn't he? Right? Because that really shows, remember, for not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the what? Doers of the law shall be justified. So once again, be careful of excuses because if we start getting in down the path of excuses, the devil will give us a hundred excuses, if not a thousand, as to why we don't have to really follow the will of God. You see, you can follow an excuse if you want, but you'll still be held accountable. You'll still be held accountable. Uh, I've shown some people things in the Bible that are so plain, so clear, you couldn't deny it, and yet they'll just say, well, I don't think that's that important. What would God think of that if you say, well, I just don't think that is important? In other words, Lord, you wrote it in there, but it, I guess it was just, you know, just to fill up space. That's playing the Holy Spirit if we think that we'll decide what's important what's not important, right? Some insist on saying, well, that's just the way we've always done it. Yes, the Bible says a different thing, but we've just always done it that way. My father did it, my grandfather did it, and so I guess I'll have to do it. What that person is really saying is, God, I've already made up my mind what I'm going to believe, so what you have to say really doesn't matter. I mean, let's just say it the way it really is, right? Friends, know this, that God does not reveal all of his will to us at any one time. He does that out of love for us. You knew that, didn't you? Because if he did, it would overwhelm us. But what they don't realize is that because you have been a good Christian, because you have been living up to the light that you knew, God is blessing you with more light. Amen? It's not to be a burden in your life. It's a blessing to you. It's actually a reward to you for your faithfulness. And so don't think that, uh, that you cannot see new light just because you've been a Christian for past years and have not seen it before. In other words, Jesus says, walk while you have the light, lest that light turn to what? darkness that's right so the light can only be with us a period of time proverbs 4 and verse 18 says the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and what more unto the perfect day if we are not willing to continue in growth then that verse cannot possibly be fulfilled in our life to shine more and more unto the perfect day as god desires it to happen in our life you see if someone says my church follows something differently 
we have to say to ourselves, what is going to be the final authority in our life? Is it going to be God's Word or is it going to be the church we happen to attend? Here in Acts 18, 24, the Bible says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man. There's the first nice thing the Bible has to say about this man. And mighty in the Scriptures, there's the second nice thing, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. And being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord. And being, okay, now lo, notice what it goes on to say here. Knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Now let's stop there. This man was eloquent. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. This man was fervent in the spirit. This man was bold in his preaching. This man, well, let's face it, everyone would love to have him as a pastor in their church, right? You look at all those qualifications. Does that mean he couldn't be taught anything? Does that mean he couldn't grow well, let's look what it says next. Whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more, what? Perfectly. Could he learn? Yes. It doesn't matter, friends, how eloquent a person is, how bold, how fervent, how instructed, they always can be taught more. Amen. They took him and said, you, with all of your gifts, can know the way of God more perfectly still. And so it is today, dear friends. So it is today. There are many who will insist on running to their pastor, priests, or rabbis, and they'll say, pastor, priest, or rabbi, whatever you say is okay with me. I've got a question. I learned an issue down the seminar, and I'm not really sure about it. I mean, it's what the Bible says, but we, we, don't, we teach differently on it, so I'm going to throw it over to you, and whatever you say, that's okay with me. Do you know, now listen carefully, lest you misunderstand my these next words, that is a cult mentality. I'm not saying they're in a cult, but I'm saying it's a cult mentality to simply say, here's our leader, and whatever our leader has to say, talking about a human leader, then that's what we're going to do. That's one of the characteristics of a cult, you see. Now, friends, it's like tossing your eternal life over to someone and say, here, you handle it for me. I can't figure it out, so you take care of it. How dangerous is that, amen? Now, you see, I don't mind if people come to me and ask me questions. In fact, I quite enjoy it. I enjoy a good discussion in God's Word, but even though I enjoy that and I'm willing to give as good an answers as I know how, I don't want anyone putting their final trust in me because I'm a fallible human being, amen? And so I will always say, put your final trust in the Bible and follow the Bible because that's what we want to do. So we don't want to be gullible and go down that road and say, well, whatever the Bible, whatever my pastor says, then I'm just going to take that and throw out, the, throw out what I've learned. And now some will say, well, I can't follow what I've learned. I say, why not? Well, others would make fun of me. What did Jesus say? Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be what? Exceeding glad for great, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. So we can't, we can't think that we will never, ever face opposition because we know truth. If, if someone makes fun of us for being a Christian, is that the worst thing that can come to us? When millions of people have laid down their life to follow Jesus in the past? Why, as I shared to you, I think it was a week ago, when someone makes fun of us, friends, God is giving us an opportunity to build strong spiritual muscles, isn't he? We are building the spiritual muscles that are necessary to take us through to the end. And so rather than be glum and despondent about it, rejoice in it, as Jesus says, and says, listen, you have a reward for following truth, but any experience like that that comes to us is a necessary experience. Did you know that? I'm going to tell you tomorrow morning about my personal testimony as much as I can fit in the time that we have, and I will share with you how... Uh, I went through a lot of these very same things, but I'm so glad now that I went through them. It wasn't enjoyable at the time. I don't think I jumped up and was exceeding glad at the time, but I will tell you now that as I look back on it, I am glad that God put me through it. Amen? I am glad. Um, there'll be those who will come up to me and they'll say, well, Pastor Brian, I went to your seminar and I learned the things that you shared and I couldn't help but seeing that it was in the Bible, but I went home and talked to my brother-in-law and he disagrees with you, Pastor Brian. And furthermore, he has got a Ph.D. I'll say, really? Now, first of all, he didn't say what he had a Ph.D. in. <laughs> it could be a Ph.D. in entomology, the study of insects. We don't know, you know. <laughs> what could it be? It might not be necessarily theology. Furthermore, every church has Ph.D.s. Now, I'm not against higher education, as long as it doesn't mix us up in the Bible. 
But I'm not against higher education at all. But friends, every church has PhDs. The Catholic Church has PhDs, and the Baptist Church has PhDs, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church has PhDs, and there are, there are differences in belief, so PhDs is not an assurance of having a proper understanding in the Bible. But I like to share it this way. I say, listen, there's no one with a PhD that's going to stand beside you in the judgment and answer for you. Amen. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the only degree we really need to go through is what I call a TBA. A TBA, we're all going to need that. And you know why? Because that stands for truly born again. Amen. And don't we all, Jesus said, unless you're born again, you shall not see the kingdom of heaven. And so we all need a TBA. And you know what, dear friends? Truly born again people will follow the word of God for what it says. You see? So we don't have to worry about that. Some will say, but Pastor Brian... My pastor sees differently than you do. I like to say, well, no, it's not what I say. It's what the Bible says. But nevertheless, they'll say, my pastor sees differently than that. And furthermore, he is so sincere. He, I get this one almost as much as anything. And they'll say, he is, he is such a sincere man. How could he be wrong when you just, I just, he oozes sincerity. So how can he be wrong? My wife and I, when we're not in seminars, we travel a lot. We do a lot of driving. And so we're going down the road, and uh, I don't know what it is, but when we're traveling together, my wife and I, I like to be the one behind the wheel. You know, Ben, what I'm talking about? I could sit over in the passenger seat, but I don't like it over there. I want to be the one behind the wheel. It's a man thing. I guess it's a control thing. <laughs> I don't know. But, but I, I got to have the wheel. I got to be in charge of the wheel. And then uh, she sits over on the passenger side there, and I give her the map, and I think, I'll let her think that she's the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the navigator, thank you. I'll let her think that she's the navigator, but who do I really think is the navigator? Right, I think I'm the navigator, but she, I'll let her play that part. So, so we're going down the road, and, and she will say to me, she'll say, honey, we need to turn over here. Now, I think, no, we don't. It's up here. And so I drive a little bit. I probably pass the exit, and I go up, and I'll say, no, I know where I'm going. And, I, and I, I'm driving up here, right? Now, I don't see the exit, and I think, hmm. And so I'm driving a little bit further, and then sweat starts coming down. She says, she says you know, we really should have turned back there. No, it's up here. I know it's up here. More sweat. Because <laughs> I don't like being wrong on this. And pretty soon I realize, now I'm sincere. It's not that I like driving 20 miles by the exit. Okay, I don't like doing that. I don't like wasting time. But I'm, there are times when I am really, really sincere about thinking I know where I'm going. And then what do I do? Swallow down, humble myself, turn around, head back to where she said we should exit because she was right, as usual. So, you see, my point being, you can be sincere, you can still be sincerely wrong. Amen. You see, again, that's why the conscience needs to be educated with the word. There are people over there on the other side of the world and even right here in the United States who will do all kinds of incredibly brutal and horrible acts thinking that it's the right thing because their consciences are not educated according to the word of God. So what is the end result? I can't depend on feeling. I can't depend on tradition. I can't depend on habit. I, all of those things can be wrong. I can't depend on even sincerity. God wants us to be sincere. The only thing I can do is come to the Lord with an open heart and the open Bible and say, Dear Lord, you show me what is right, and that's what I'm going to do. Once again, the Spirit will lead us. Some will say, Well, I am going to do it. I'm just not going to do it now. Okay, I'm going to see if you've been paying attention tonight. Three frogs are sitting on a log on a pond, and one of them decides to jump off, so how many's left? Well, okay, most of you didn't get it, so I'm going to have to say it again. Only this time I'll emphasize the key word, and then you're going to get it. Three frogs are sitting on a log on a pond. One of them decides to jump off. So how many are left? Three. Ah, you got it now. Okay. Why? Because deciding to is not the same as doing it. Amen. Amen. You can sit there all day long and say, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Friends, when you really want to do something, you're going to do it right now, right? Can I say, I am going to quit smoking after I smoke this pack and this pack and this carton and this carton? Am I really sincere? 
Can I say, yes, you know, I've got a shoplifting habit and I am going to quit stealing. Yes, I'm going to quit stealing. I just want to hit this store and that store and hit that store over there. Okay. Again, when you really are sincere, you're going to quit right now. You're going to do it right now. That's what it really means. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 51, please. Psalm 51. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Well, why is that? Because you're planning to do wrong. You cannot fully repent at the same time plan to do what's wrong. Now, David, of course, did something that was very, very wrong, didn't he? And when he did his horrible sin with Bathsheba, he thought that he might have gotten away with something, but God sent the prophet Nathan up to David, and in essence, he said, you know, David, when you did that, God wasn't sleeping. God wasn't, you know, off in some corner somewhere and didn't, didn't watch it. God knew all that you did. Now, the wonderful thing about David is that David was a man that knew how to repent, didn't he? Oh, he could do some things wrong at times, but boy, could this man repent. And that might be what sets David above some of us sometimes. But Psalm 51, here's a beautiful passage here, and we can't read it all through. I hope that you will if you haven't already. Let's go down if we could to verse 10. And just put your name right in there. Create in me a clean heart. Oh, I like to say, create in Brian a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Verse 11 is the vital verse, folks. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Now, why did David pray, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me? Because David knew that if God took the Holy Spirit from him, he would remain in his sins, you see, because it's only the Holy Spirit that leads him to want to repent. He, David said in Psalm 19, verse 13, David said, Keep back thy servant also from what kind of sins? Presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. Presumptuous sins. David said, Don't let me commit those. Those are sins when you go into it knowing what you're doing, but you're going to do it anyway. So here's the question, folks. What is the sin against the Holy Spirit? What is the one sin that cannot be forgiven? Let me try to say it in as simple a language as I know how. The sin that God does not forgive is when you know something is wrong, but you persistently continue to do that thing which is wrong, and you refuse to do that which is right, and finally, you don't hear God's voice anymore calling you to want to repent. It's, again, there's a wall of resistance that's been built up in the mind. There's a callousness that's going there. That's what... That's what Paul means when he says to Timothy that the conscience is seared with a hot iron. You remember reading that? That's what he's talking about. There's a callousness there that all of a sudden, it's not that that person can't be forgiven. God could forgive it. Any type of sin can be forgiven. It's not, the unpardonable sin is not murder per se and adultery per se or lying or stealing per se. God can forgive all of those things, can't he? It might be what, be what might be considered a little thing, but that person consistently cherishes it and holds on to it and won't give it go. It's let it go. It's not that God wouldn't forgive it, but that person doesn't want it to be forgiven. So they don't give it over to God. They don't let God forgive it. And so the sin against the Holy Spirit is our, uh, the sin against the, the unpardonable sin, rather, is our final and deliberate refusal to do what Jesus allowed the Holy, or sent the Holy Spirit to do. Jesus sent the Holy Spirit into this world. We read there in John 16, to convict of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and to lead us into all truth. And so if we refuse to allow Jesus, uh, the Holy Spirit to lead us into all truth, we're refusing the Holy Spirit to do the work that he was sent in this world to do. Now, when the Bible says that the Holy Spirit was sent to convict of sin, Remember what we learned what sin was? Sin was the transgression of the what? Uh, um, yes, yeah, sin is the transgression of the what? Of the law, that's right. So that means that the Holy Spirit is going to convict us of where we are transgressing God's law. It might be that we're committing adultery. And you see, when someone might first commit adultery, they might be convicted about it. But you know, you can do something and then and be convicted about it, but then remain in it and keep doing it and doing it and doing it and doing it, and pretty soon they don't feel anything wrong with it. Yeah. No big deal, they'll say. What have they done? They've pushed the Holy Spirit's voice away. You see, I'm gonna, again, I'm going to share with you my personal testimony tomorrow morning, but I will tell you this. There was a time in my life when God was convicting me about his law. And there was finally a time when it built up in my mind to such a degree, I said, I can no longer continue to do this and sin against God. That's what conviction is. That's what conscience is. God wants us to have our spiritual antenna up on high so that we will easily, continually, 
receive those messages from the Holy Spirit. Sin in our life is a slow strangulation of the spiritual nature. Did you know that? Some people will say to me, they'll say, well, I can't keep the Sabbath. I'll say, why can't you keep the Sabbath? They'll say, well, if, if I keep the Sabbath, I can't make the kind of money I'm making now. And, and because I've been working on that day, I've been able to not only get a bigger house, I've been able to get two of the most late model cars, I've been able to get a, a ranch in the high desert, I've been able to, I got a lot of things because I worked on that time. Now when that person, you see, when that person raises up in the second resurrection and they're outside of the walls of the new Jerusalem, which we talked about there on the night of the millennium, and they're saying, Lord, Lord, why? Why am I not in? Why am I outside and not inside those walls? And Jesus says, you did not show yourself a faithful steward. You did not show yourself desirous of keeping the laws of heaven. And then because I couldn't trust you he, there, I can't trust you here. And that person will say, but Lord, look what I've been able to accumulate. I, I worked on the Sabbath, sure I did, but my, I, I got a lot of stuff from it. And the Lord is going to say, well, where's those things now? What good are all those things to you now? And I don't know what all Jesus would say to that, but I will say he might say something like this. He might turn to the New Jerusalem and say, well, you know what? We own it all here. Eh? <laughs> we own everything here. And all of this glory could have been given to you for free. But you did not choose for eternity. But you did not choose to be faithful on earth. I can't trust you here. Now, friends, when light comes, we need to see it as a precious thing. Amen? Don't say to yourself, one day I'll quit smoking, let me smoke this carton first. Or don't say, one day I'll keep the Sabbath, let me make a few more dollars first. Or don't say, I'm going to soon get my anger under control, let me get rid of my spouse first. <laughs> don't say that, friends. The problem is not the Sabbath, and the problem is not your spouse. Amen? <laughs> the problem is we need new hearts, don't we? And if we get a new heart, it'll solve these issues. And when God has people that have new hearts, and God has people that want to serve Him, and, and the Holy Spirit writes His law in their heart, that they want to do all that God says, well, then what does God do with these precious people? Well, the Bible has an answer to that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and in verse 13, it says this, for we, I'm sorry, for by one Spirit are we all what? Baptized into how many bodies? One body whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. In other words, what we're told here is that God will then take these precious people that desire to follow all that the Bible says, and he baptizes them into that one body. Now, what body is that? Friends, that's the body that we've been covering about here in these last nights of the seminar, the one that the Bible calls God's remnant. God's remnant people are those people that God is using to give a message of truth around this world. You see, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, remember that the Scripture says, then they that gladly received His word were baptized. So are you glad to receive His word out there tonight? And friends, some of you have been baptized, I know, and some of you are planning on it as well, and we, we praise God for that. But then it says, and the same day there were added unto them, them being the church, about 3,000 souls. So did God just let them be baptized and wander out into the world without putting them to work? No, he says, no, I've got a body for you to join. And they added them unto God's church. Verse 47 says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the what, friends? The church daily such as should be saved. Now, how does God add people to his church? How does he awaken people to a knowledge that they need to be added to his church? He does it by sending a message around the world. Did you know that? In Revelation chapter 14, and we've read this number of nights, it says, And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him. Friends, why a loud voice? Because the soft voice you won't pay attention to. The soft voice you won't think is important, right? What the Bible is telling us by giving us this passage is that in the last days, the Lord is going to shout a message to the world. Babylon is fallen, is fallen. It's not coming back. There's truth to follow. Amen. There's a message to listen to. Don't stay in Babylon. This is the loud voice. In other words, urgent times 
demand an urgent message. We're not living in pleasure as usual, business as usual type of times. God says, I've got a message. I've got a people to give that message. And Revelation only gives two groups, folks. It gives Babylon and the remnant. Those are the only two choices we have. In all of the book of Revelation, it says, there is Babylon and all the world is wandering after the beast and all that goes with that, and then it's the remnant. And friends, as the old cliche says, either we are part of the problem or part of the solution. Those are the only two sides. Jesus says, you are for me or you are against me. And we've looked at all the wonderful characteristics of God's remnant church. We studied that this last week. I hope that you were here, and if you weren't, I pray you'll get the information on this. Friends, God has a people that's giving that very message. And he says he will do it before Jesus comes back. Are we living in the last days? Amen. Amen. Can you say it louder than that for me? Amen. Did God say he's going to have a message go all the way around the world before Jesus comes back? Amen. Amen. Did he say it's going to be in every nation, kindred, tongue, and people? Yes. Then we should be able to see that message tonight. And we do, friends. And that message is found in the church that happens to be bringing you this seminar, the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And not because that those people are anything more special or sanctified, but here is a group that God is calling and adding to daily such as should be saved. And friends, it is our privilege to know this message. Would you please turn with me to Matthew chapter 10? Jesus says regarding that message, if any man have ears to hear, let him hear. Well, friends, I hope you've got big ears tonight. I hope you've got ears that are listening to what God has to say. Matthew chapter 10. We're going to look here at verse 32 and up to 39. Kind of a long passage, but you might be sitting there saying, well, you know, Pastor, I'm getting a lot of heat at home. I mean, I've got a spouse that's giving me a terrible problem, and I'm sorry to hear that, but it's often the truth. Sometimes those who are closest to us, you know, are most outspoken against us when we want to follow truth. It's just a sad thing. But Jesus even speaks to this issue. And in verse 32 of Matthew 10, the Bible says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Then Jesus says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. Now, friends, let me interject something here. Jesus came to bring peace within, didn't he? But outside there could be a sword of trial and difficulty at times. Let's keep reading. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own what? Household. And then Jesus says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. Friends, Jesus tells us that sometimes those that are persecuting us can be those that are closest to us. Have you ever noticed that sometimes you can have nobody really pay attention to you? You can be out in the world as I was, living, you know, for self and for foolish pride, and nobody bothers you. And then all of a sudden you want to come to a prophecy seminar and do what's right, and you've got more counselors and you know what to do with. Isn't that right? And people are coming up to you out of nowhere, calling you from across the country at times, saying, oh, hang on a second. Are you really sure you want to do that? And all you want to do is follow the Bible. Right? And they say, oh, don't go so fast. That would be fanatical. Oh, don't do that. That would be legalism. And they've got all these ways of trying to talk you out of doing what is the Christian life. Right? Isn't it amazing? Didn't care about you when out in the world, but then you want to get your act together and straighten out and walk according to the ways of Jesus, and they want to give you all this counsel. Friends, don't be fooled by it. Many people want to keep you back from following the Word of God because if what you're doing is right, that is convicting to them that what they're doing is wrong, and the old saying is misery loves company, and often they would rather hold you back than follow what the Word says themselves. Right? That's just the basic, that's just the basic facts of the matter. And uh, I know you've gone through it. People, I, I love it when people say, you know, I'm willing to change my understanding of Scripture. Why? Because I'm getting ready for heaven. And some people, because you've come to the seminar, you're saying, I'm changing my diet. Why? Because I'm getting ready for heaven. I want heaven's diet. Some of you are saying, I'm changing my dress. Why? Because I'm getting ready for heaven. Some of you are saying, I'm changing my day of worship. Why? Because I want to get on heaven's schedule. Amen. <laughs> oh, friends, I'll tell you, that's why we're doing it. We're not doing it for any other reason other than we love Jesus and we're getting ready for eternity here. That's what it's all about. And that's the price of discipleship. I know that some of these decisions that you've been making are difficult now. 
And I could have, if I wanted to, and some of these other pastors that are present here, if they wanted to, they could get up here and preach smooth things. But the Bible says don't preach smooth things. Preach the straight truth. And they'll say, Pastor, I, you know, uh, you preach straight, and this church is straight. Well, friends, let me tell you something. I thank God it's straight. The Bible doesn't talk about going the broad road. It says we should go the straight and narrow way, right? That's the way we want to go in. Night by night, I could have stood up here and preached the smooth things if I thought I wanted to get a larger audience at times. But God says, don't do that. Love the people enough to tell them the truth. And I do love you enough by God's grace to want to share truth with you. And as I said one other night, I would rather preach the truth to one person sitting here tonight and have a clear conscience about it then compromise and get an audience of 10,000. I can't do that by God's grace. There might be others willing to do that, but I'm not going to do it. And you don't want me to do it, amen? amen? I know it. I thank God for all the decisions that have been made in this seminar, but I know there's going to be some more made tonight by God's grace. And I hope that you'll just be sitting there saying, Lord, I'm, whatever the past has been, I'm going to move ahead and I'm going to follow what I know is right. Tonight I want to encourage you and I want to plead with you. Uh, if you hear a conviction in your heart, if you feel it, and God is trying to move you ahead. There was a time when I was, oh, I would say 14 years old, and I got the most amazing present as a Christmas present. Now, are you ready for this? I mean, this was hot on the market, newest technology, just out. I opened up this gift, and my eyes about popped out because there in front of my very eyes and in my hands was a radio alarm clock. They took a radio, and they took an alarm clock, and they managed to put it together in one package. Isn't technology amazing? Am I old or what? Okay. And so, I mean, they had not, we had not seen this before. And it was one of those alarm clocks where, the, as the numbers come over, they were on little flaps, and they would, it would turn and go, and fall. Anybody? Anybody have one? Okay. And you'd, and you'd get mesmerized by it. You'd watch it because you think it's about to turn, it's about to turn, it's about to... Uh, there it went. <sighs> we didn't have much to do back then. <laughs> and so, but it had something else. It had something else. On the top of it was a big, wide, rectangular bar, and it said snooze button on the top. And so what I did was, I said, this was new technology too, I thought. And so what I did was I put my bed, and here's my little night table, and I put that radio alarm clock just at arm's length where the snooze button was so that if I woke up, my hand could just turn over and whack right on that white button. <laughs> Five more minutes, right? And then I could even do it this way, whack, and you get to be really good at it. And I could hit that thing. And what, I learned something by hitting the snooze button. If you hit that snooze button too many times, you know, and each time the alarm is going off and you, you shut it off, and the alarm goes off, you shut it off, pretty soon you can snooze right through that alarm. I used to be a real estate agent. I'll tell you a little bit about that tomorrow morning. But when I was a real estate agent, we would ask people who were, who were living right near a railroad track how many trains came by because we knew whoever wanted to buy the house would, would ask the same question. So we'd say, well, you're living right here by the railroad tracks. How many trains come by? And they'd say, well, what trains? And we'd say, the trains that come by here in the day, how many? I don't know. I mean, I heard them when we first moved here, but we've lived here so long, I don't hear them anymore. I couldn't tell you if there's one train, five trains. I don't know. I, we just ignore them. We tune it out. Friends, that's why the Bible says, saying with a loud voice, because God's saying, don't tune it out, tune it in. Amen? Don't snooze while the message is being preached around the world, calling people to come into God's remnant fold. Oh, friends, listen, don't tune the Spirit out tonight either. In Romans 8 and verse 14, we read these words. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the what? Sons of God. And so God's children say, Lord, I might be 15 years of age and just starting out in life, or I might be 85 years of age, gray-haired, and I don't know how many years I got left, but I still want to follow your Spirit. Whatever it is, we tune God in because we're sons and daughters of God. And those who desire to be led, they are the true family of God. I want to know if God is pleading with you tonight, friends. So often people say, well, Pastor Brian, I sense God is leading me. I feel his spirit convicting me, and I know that I should make changes in my life. I'm just not going to do it now. It reminds me of the man who wanted to have a sidewalk, and so he made the forms for his sidewalk, 
And then he went out and he mixed up the cement mixture, the concrete mixture, and he came with his machine and he poured it out there. And after pouring it out, he said, oh, I'm kind of hungry, I think I'll go to lunch. Any contractors here? Any sidewalk makers here? Friends, when you pour it out, you don't go to lunch, amen. <laughs> That's not the time to go to lunch. Why? Because there is a period of time when that mixture is pliable, workable, movable. But if you go to lunch and you come back, that mixture, which was once so soft, is now hard as concrete, right? In the same way, the human heart is like that. We could have hearts tonight that are moved by God's Spirit, and want to do what God's will, and we may want to move forward, but you don't know how the devil is going to attack you in days to come. And if you tell the devil, I'm not going to do it now, I'll do it three months from now, six months from now, someday, friends, you know what the devil's favorite word is? Tomorrow. Because as long as the devil can get you to say tomorrow, tomorrow he'll say what? Tomorrow. And the next day and the next week, the devil will still come to you and say, don't do it now, just do it tomorrow. And pretty soon you run out of tomorrows, and that's exactly what the devil's hoping for, friends. So don't say tomorrow. Say, Lord, by your grace, I'm going to make a decision today. Amen? Today is the day of salvation. So says the Word of God. Now, I know that many of you might be sitting there tonight saying, Pastor Ryan, since I've been coming to this seminar, I have been going through such turmoil in my mind. I mean, I have been having fitful sleeps. I have been, and I can relate, I went through this. I, I have been waking up in a sweat I have been just going through a spiritual tug of war, and it's exactly what it is. And you're saying, what is going on in my mind? I'll tell you what's going on, dear friend. There is a battle called the great controversy between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. There are armies on both sides, and both are vying for our loyalty. Did you know that? And in your mind, you're making a decision for God or, or not. And when the devil knows that you are right in that valley of decision, that moment of decision, the devil is going to try as hard as he can to hold you back. And God isn't going to just let you go without a fight, friends. God is going to fight as hard as he possibly can, as hard as you will let him fight. He will fight for you and for me. And so what you have is a spiritual tug of war. It's the Spirit of God fighting against the Spirit of Satan, both sides desiring to have your allegiance. And here's the good news. When you say, Lord, I'm going to follow what's right, Lord, I am going to do what the Bible says. The, the Lord says to Satan, get thee behind this person because they are giving me permission to work in their life. God steps in and all of a sudden, what was so fitful asleep, now all of a sudden you can sleep like a baby because you know why? The best pillow in the world is a peaceful conscience, amen? And don't ever think, you all of a sudden will be able to sleep so well because you know you really did what is right. I want to share a verse with you before we go home tonight. It's found in Isaiah 41 and verse 10. Isaiah 41 and verse 10. You know, God weeps over those who turn away. But even though he weeps over those who turn away, God will not change, friends, what the Word has to say. In the days of Noah, God said, if eight are getting in the ark, then eight's all what I'll take. The Lord is no different tonight. In the story of the rich young ruler, the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Lord, what must I, have, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus says, if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said, all these things have I done for my youth, what yet I lack. Now Jesus saw the point in his life where he was covetous. He put his finger right on that soft spot and he said, this is your problem, and he named it. He says, go and sell what you have and give to the poor and come follow me. Now, friends, that man counted the cost. He thought the cost was too high. He turned around and walked away. Now, the part that impresses me so much when I read that story is not just tragically that he turned away, but that Jesus did not compromise his principles for that man. He loved that man. He longed for that man in his kingdom. But Jesus didn't run after that man and say, oh, wait, 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 wait. Now, hold it a second. Uh, let me reconsider. You're walking away? Okay, uh, meet me halfway. Sell half of what you have. You know, I'll give a little, you give a little. Did Jesus do that? No. Jesus laid out the terms, and he said, this is what it's going to take. You see, dear friends, for some of you, it's going to mean giving up worldly friendships. 
uh, walking away from peers that don't want to follow the Word of God. For some of you, it might be fi uh, sacrificing some finances because you won't work on God's Sabbath. I don't know what it's going to be for you. But whatever it is, friends, God is there to see you through. Amen? Greater is he that is with us than he that is against us. Isaiah 41 and verse 10 is a promise for all of us. And I would like to ask you if you would read this out loud with me together. Okay? Let's go. Together, Isaiah 41, verse 10. Here we go. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Friends, that's a promise to all of you tonight. God isn't going to leave you. God isn't going to forsake you when you want to do right. If God was with you when you did things wrong and ignorance, how much more is God going to want to be with you when you want to do what's right? Isn't that right? You see, and don't think that God isn't striving with you. The very fact that you are still here after 20 nights is the sign that God is striving with you and that you are willing to, to hold on and still come. See, that's a great sign. That should encourage you that God is with you and God is working in you because you are here after all of these nights. In Psalm 29 and verse 11, it says this, The Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with what? With peace. Many of our relatives did not know the things that we've learned in this seminar. Our fathers, mothers perhaps, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, maybe even more so, Maybe they didn't know the truth of the clean and unclean foods. Maybe they didn't know the truth of the Sabbath. Maybe they didn't know the truth of the state of the dead. But God is calling people around this world to understand what the Bible says so that he can have a people ready for Jesus. Isn't that right? Shall we stand tonight as we close with God's, with a prayer? Father in heaven, I thank you again that we can come tonight, open your word, and realize that you are leading your people some ever so gently, some with great conviction, but Lord, you are leading as a good shepherd will the sheep of your pasture. You will speak and your sheep will hear your voice and follow. And so may all of us, Lord, have the kind of hearts that long to be molded, filled with your spirit and, and led by the heavenly shepherd. And so guide us now, we pray tonight. Continue to bless tonight and, and tomorrow night and each, each night, Father, that we come together that all these things that we have learned can be part of our faith, the Christian faith, the faith of Jesus. Bless us now and send us from this place, but Lord, not from your presence ever, and bring us back again, we pray, tomorrow morning in Jesus' name. Amen.